Practicing true humanness is the topic that we're going to go over today. Big theme in the Hermetica and uh, in Gnosticism, it's Gnostic branch. There's a lot of uh, references to what they call the true human being. So how do you practice true humanness? That's the question. And the Hermetica has a lot of answers um, that form a coherent picture of how we do this. So one thing to do, and I'm going to cover details of this uh, later in later videos, are spiritual exercises to develop our mental and emotional faculties. So there's three in particular that get a lot of emphasis. Gnosis, or having some kind of clear, direct, internal sense of not only the divine, but the sacredness in everything, developing the sense of the sacred in everything, that kind of gnosis. Logos, which means mindful speech and mindful thought. Are our thoughts clear? Do we have critical thinking abilities? Um, do we write clearly? Do we say what we intend to say? So logos in that sense, practicing logos. And then noose, creative consciousness is creativity an integral part of how we live, not just making art, unless we're artists, or music or dance, but do we live creatively? Do we live with the, the permanent, flexible mental set of there are opportunities to innovate all, all over? So those are three sp examples of spiritual exercises. There's others too, such as ritual and ceremony. Um, I've mentioned previously the, the practice of Egyptian priests facing the four directions at dawn and at dusk and giving thanks to the earth and also prayer as well. And I'll have more to say about that, that in a later video too. But um, to give you a preview, prayer from a hermetic standpoint is, is a place of gratitude, not asking for things. So the definitions of Hermes Trismegistus to Asclepius would add to that list by saying, we need to be able to develop an ethics of care, an appreciation of beauty, especially the beauty of nature and the world, the study of science. So exploring the universe, the planet, nature, ourselves scientifically and storytelling and the preservation and elaboration of lore. So let's start with ethics. That was a strong part of the hermetic practice. And there are lists. So for instance, in the Corpus Hermeticum book nine, the, the list says, um, avoid murders, avoid adulteries. In other words, being unfaithful. Um, don't assault your father. It's generally a good idea. Uh, avoid acts of sacrilege and irreverence. And um, here's one that perhaps doesn't apply to our time so much. Avoid committing suicide by hanging or falling off a cliff. So that's the opinion of book nine of the Corpus Hermeticum. Book 10 adds a piece and says, the pious fight consists in knowing the divine and doing ill to no one. And this always reminds me of one of Plato's conversations in the Republic where Socrates is arguing with uh, Polymarchus, whose name literally means warlord. And Polymarchus is arguing in terms of ethics that it is just to support your friends and hurt your enemies. That's where he comes from. I know a lot of people that subscribe to that in this country. Um, he's all for expedience, right? So Socrates asks him, but what if our friends do evil? And Polymarchus says, uh, yeah, that's a point. Um, so how about this? It's just to do good to our friends when they are good and to harm our enemies when they are evil. And then Socrates says, but ought the just to injure anyone at all? It's also a very hermetic idea. I have talked publicly about and written about something that I call the fivefold caring 
that is consistent with what's per, uh, what is presented in the Hermeticum and along the lines of ethics. And so I want to unpack that a little bit. The fivefold caring, and I, I developed this in terms of how do we live in such a chaotic time, crazy politics, planetary mayhem, and everything else, the, else that's going on. So the fivefold caring is caring for oneself. This is not an order. They don't go in order. Caring for oneself, caring for others, caring for earth, caring for vision, and caring for story. So let's go through this. So self-care. You need support. We're living not just in a dark night of the soul, but a dark night of the planetary soul. And nobody can do that alone. It's important to have support. And uh, here's some examples of where to get it. There's a network right now called Good Grief. And they have to do with dealing with what's being called eco-anxiety, which is actually rational fear of what's happening in terms of climate change, habitat destruction, pollution of the oceans, methane release, and all that stuff. So if you want to be with a group of people who get why it's completely rational to be scared of all that and grief, grief about all the things that we're losing, including, including massive species loss, uh, that's a good group to, to be a part of. Um, I would recommend simply ignoring climate deniers. That's it's a defense. It's a form of what Twain would call moral cowardice. No, no sense spending any time on that. Um, get support from people who get it. Also, look after your mental and physical health. Right, your mental and physical health very important. And then find ways to reconnect with the natural world. Uh, this is sometimes known as ecotherapy, which is an umbrella term for establishing establishing healing and reciprocal relations with nature and place and earth. Even a little bit of enhanced nature contact can prove healthy. And there's massive amounts of science to back that up. So caring for others, uh, that one should be obvious. And it's, it's really a barometer of the craziness of our time that caring for other people is now demonized, uh, especially in the States, as some kind of socialism or partisan agenda. Um, personally, I'm a completely nonpartisan person, and I think that not caring for other people is a form of immaturity. It means that you haven't grow up, grown up emotionally. Um, demonizing those who care for others is simply evil, both from a hermetic standpoint and pretty much from the standpoint of every significant moral system in the world. So other care can also include trying to protect and preserve what's left of the planet for future generations. And uh, also for people who need help of some kind because perhaps they are poor or they're living in uh, areas that are taking a real beating environmentally and they can't protect themselves. So not heroically rescuing them, but more along the lines of what Mary Watkins calls accompaniment, being with them and what they're going through, being with them. A, a non-heroic, non-colonizing -col being with, accompanying them. And then there's, there's groups that you can join, the work that reconnects Refugees International, Planting Justice in the Bay Area, great group. And then uh, sometimes activism, if you feel called to that. So earth care is next. Um, letting earth speak to your, your permeable heart. What about what's going on specifically reaches out to you? Is it animals and food? Is it climate action? Usually it's some one thing that really breaks the heart or gets into it is probably a better way of saying it. And so let that be your guidance about how you should respond. It's impossible to take the whole thing on. It's systemic and planetary. But when you start working on one particular thing that means a lot to you, really you're addressing all of it because it is systemic. Vision care is next. And um, this can mean a number of things. One of them is in good hermetic tradition, honoring what are called non-ordinary states of consciousness like intuition, uh, deep imagination, visionary experience itself in, in whatever form that takes. 
medicine work, um, in the states of inspiration, that kind of thing, dreams. Um, this isn't quite the, the same as self-care because all this goes on, not just for you and in you, but it's also operating within and out, not only within, but outside as well. It's non-dual. So respecting that part of yourself that taps into all that, that's, that's all bound up with what the Hermetics called noose. And then um, also vision care, being open to states of love and play and wonder as they occur spontaneously. And uh, I mentioned dreams too, tending your dreams, hearing the symbolism in them and what they might be trying to say to you. And then lastly, story care. So I coined enchantabism to indicate not only new stories about what's going right, but old ones that are redreamed. And this isn't about positive thinking, which I consider a form of denial, um, unless it's used in very specific circumstances. But in general, positive thinking and positive psychology appeal to that part of us that wants to just ignore the mayhem that's going on and pretend that things are fine. They're not fine. So for realists, what, what do stories look like, whether they're folklore, myth, myths retold, legends, um, folk tales, what have you, or anecdotes about how people are bearing up under everything that they have to deal with? How do those look when they come out of situations of injustice or some kind of cultural or planetary rupture? But, but and here's the important point, they're more spacious than that because we can't imagine where we can go unless we have some sense of imagination to begin with. We have to get somehow above or behind what's going wrong. We, we have to be very clear on what's going on, no doubt about that. But what else? What else is going on? It's not enough to be against. What are we for? What kind of earth do we wanna live on? What kind of societies do we wanna to build together? So Victor Hugo had a thought about this. Um, he was, he's often identified with the romantic tradition and the romantics were heavily influenced by hermeticism. So here's what he said. The human soul has still greater need of the ideal than the real. It is by the real that we exist. It is the, by the ideal that we live. Part of this too could be looking for the wisdom in nature of folklore, which is something I've presented a lot. Other people are too. There's books on this and there's tending those kinds of dreams that seem to connect us directly to the world itself and what it's thinking about, so to speak. Um, and there's also considering the possibility that, you know, $10 words like sustainability, which are very rational sounding, aren't really going to do it in terms of motivation. We're not into sustainability anymore. We've passed that point. We're into repair and regeneration. That's what our agenda has to be. And uh, as part of that restitution, especially for people who have had so much taken away from them, there's no way to make up for those injustices, but at least there could be some kind of redemption and peacemaking in the present. So all of these have been stated very abstractly, but dry goals uh, in the light of imagination and desire have a way of becoming missions and even a journey. So that's a way to think about this too. Another practice of becoming fully human involves standing up as it's put in the Hermetica. Um, F. Sutan is the, the Coptic way of saying it. And it has a couple of meanings. One is that standing up is an interior move that disidentifies us with our compulsions and our passions, the ones that are ruling us. Um, it's not just we having feelings, it's our feelings having us, which is not a good place to be. It's almost like a state of possession. So standing up in that sense, but also in a liberatory sense is the sense of, of making a choice. The early church fathers, uh, Irenaeus in particular was the one who got this going, referred to the Gnostics as heretics. And that was his particular use of the word. But originally, the word heretic comes from a word that means choose, 
we make ourselves by our decisions, what will we choose to do today? Because that will affect who we become not only today, but for all time forward. So standing up in that sense. And the image that comes up a lot in the Hermetica is about resurrection. So in order to advance along what's called the way of immortality in the discourse on the eighth and the ninth, we must pass through some sort of initiatory mystery that constitutes a rite of regeneration. And initiations that are real are hard. Initiations become kind of a trendy idea in some circles. You know, you have a ceremony, you make a commitment of some kind, you, you maybe give up something and all that. But real initiation means getting turned inside out. It means sacrifice and confrontation with death. So Sean Kelly, the philosopher, has argued in his books that we're actually undergoing a planetary initiation now, that we've pushed ourselves as a species right to the edge of the abyss. Now that's an initiation. How will we bear up? So this doesn't just bring vision and new knowledge and insight to the person who's getting initiated but it also enables him to recognize in the one in initiating the figure of Hermes Trismegistus himself operating behind it all. So I, I find it reassuring, not comforting in the sense of a defense, but reassuring that if you hold all this symbolically, there's a wisdom that is above human wisdom behind a lot of this, not in the sense of some sort of a hopeful outcome, because it really is up to us. But as with the case of traditional initiation, if we choose to move forward with it and open our eyes, the guidance is available. 